So man never catches up with knowledge. Man never has been able to experience that kind of apperception which cuts through time and makes it possible for man to become immediately aware of the total value of existence. There has to be some way in which man can break through to reality. There has to be some way in which the individual can come into possession of that which he consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously knows. So this is the key of it all, and I published it April 1st, 2015, obviously. And I pretty much give a summary of what, what I think is the key of it all, which is simply the, not even just the application of Hebrew to English, but really the, the sum of, or um, if you really look at the, the books, The Key of It All by David Allen Hulse, or what is it? Yeah, David. Um, he talks about all the different alphabets and gives their sort of like numerical structure, basically. Like, I would say that the key of it all is simply the numerical um, part of any language that essentially like, you know, uh, underlies it, I guess. And looking at them through the numbers then is like the universal language or the language of the universe. And uh, even like the code in Library El Veligis that obviously um, even Crowley was sort of like perplexed by. I think that the, the, the complexity is kind of a veil or a blind, but when you study the Kabbalah, like it becomes a little more uh, elucidated, I guess. And like Kenneth Grant even talks about in numerous uh, quotes or like commentaries, basically to the book of the spider and the ninth arch, he brings this up and all these different, like different aspects of this formula um, come to play. And ABK, obviously, that's like the fool, the magician, the wheel of fortune, the letter of magic. Um, there's a lot to this formula, but I realized like when you, there's different, very simple things came up like the AL cryptogram in its lowest form with uh, Gimel for the C and cryptogram since a, B, C, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Camel shows that sort of connection. But then Cheth can sometimes be used as a veil too, um, especially for the CH or for a nuance in the C sound, like in circle, as I've shown. And uh, so really like this whole verse 76 of chapter two, actually um, Liber, or no, wait, what is it? The value of Liber... A L Vel Legis I I or chapter two seventy six. And so it's like the sum of the value of it. And then if you actually add up these values, um, the ordinal value of the letters plus these as they occur, the sum of A L seventy six. And then four, six, three, eight, A, B, K, two, four, A, L, G, M, O, R, three. Y is Yod. Stop it. Stop. What are you freaking out about? 24, 89, 2017, 14, 22, 16, 6, a and then L. So when you add that up, the sum of AL and then the actual cryptogram as well is 666, which again is this major key to the Kabbalah of nine chambers literally spelled out. Anyway, uh, I said the sum of the cryptogram in chapter 2, verse 76 of Liber AL equals 1066 using basic Hebrew English gematria, i.e. the Hebrew formula applied to the English alphabet. 
and Hebrew Kabbalah plus English Kabbalah happens to equate to 666, as well as, again, apply Hebrew to English. So note, sum, samek, vav, mem, final, and there's a lot of things where the final letters, it shows a sort of like a synthesis of this ancient system or uh, formula with modern terms, which plus 400 tau, T, the cross, the sum, tau also refers to the cross, so the symbol of which refers to the sum or addition, that symbol. Thus, plus sum is a sort of like figurative, uh, obvious sort of like telling you what to do, sum it up. Also, and that's just summing it up in the Hebrew applied to English. In 1066, like later came up to be a lot of things, and it went back to basically, like Margaret Alice Murray happened to like mention William the Conqueror in The God of the Witches, and said he was his dad was like Robert the Devil and possibly like related to the witch one of the witch cults or whatever. Um, and the devil was of course a sort of like leader of the witch cult or pagan cult um, in a wherever like a district or a, a locality. Um, but the Norman conquest of England, which was in 1066, William the Conqueror is uh, pretty much like. Essentially, what I found is that it altered history, especially in terms of language. Um, in medieval England, Murray claimed the old, the old religion had been protected by the Plantagenet dynasty of kings, beginning with William the Conqueror in 1066. These were sacred kings who had to die as sacrificial victims or else find a substitute after they had reigned for seven years or a multiple of seven years. And that goes with that whole, like, killing of the king ritual um, that she talks about pretty much the divine king, the divine victim, and uh, which comes up in Freemasonry and um, witchcraft in Anglo. So like the Anglo-Saxons, the Saxons um, were who William the Conqueror kind of represented. And it says the period of Anglo-Saxon England lasted from circa 410 through to 1066, during which individuals considered to be Anglo-Saxon in culture and language dominated the country's demographics and politics. Um, so again, paganism, sort of, um, I don't know, just goes back to this ancient religion, or the old religion, they call it. Um, <laughs> but in and it says, in 1066, the Normans invaded England. It was an event that was to transform the English language forever. And so this is weird because, like, I was already reading about, um, recently at least, this whole Shakespeare subject and controversy. And it's really interesting to me. And uh, so come to find out, there's all this stuff about language and cryptology secrecy and whatnot going back clearly to the origins of language itself. It's just really interesting. Um, the effect of 1066 on the English language. The English language that is spoken today is the direct result of 1066 in the Norman Conquest. Modern English is vastly different from that spoken by the English prior to the conquest, both in its word and its grammar. In order to understand what happened and why, it is necessary to look at both English and Norman French before 1066 and then the Middle English that resulted from their interaction. And so that was just a, an aside that I later found when remembering this number, 1066. This is all just more like a stimulus for further research and application of this knowledge. And like I said, the sum of uh, the components 10 and 66 are, of course, 76, and the sum is 13, 10 being uh, had and new, 66 being the number of the great work, the union of had and new. Um, as further verification of this formula and its relevance to the library or book, we also find that 1066 is the number of the cryptogram key itself as well as the Gematria key of Libre Alvel Legis. 
I've found it is verse 76 test, and it's found the 76 sum mem final. I've found this formula to decode the verse 76 geometria key, which when applied to the book of the law, unlocked some of the primary concepts. And again, you have to look at it through the various, like I said, the ordinal, the Hebrew, even the simple geometria has a lot of weird overlap with these other uh, systems or formulae. And <clears throat> like I've pulled up all these different books that I've gotten over the years to try and get like, I guess, insight, but also evidence of not just what is known and written, but what isn't to show that like no one for whatever reason has what I would say liberally or just like fully applied or cross applied systems, basically. Like when you apply even the Hebrew formula, the basic knowledge of it to Sanskrit, there's a lot of freaking overlap and people are stuck with these like new keys. For example, like the new Eon English Kabbalah, like I've looked into it. I just think that it's not nearly as revealing or like, uh, what is it? Just integral or integrative. And it's in this, the key of the abyss book, which this book came up for multiple reasons. Whenever I was like thinking about this blog, because it's the key of it all, the key of the abyss, and Jack Parsons and the Babylon working is a big focus of the key of the abyss by Anthony Testa. And Jack Parsons' like number was 210, and the key of it all in its lowest form, using again Hebrew applied to English, is 210. And I was thinking, like meditating on 210, and it's like literally like a dissolving into the abyss. Um, it's like the key of the abyss, the key of it all. And it's like the last two steps before the dissolution into the, you know, the abyss. So <laughs> I just think that that, and this number is odd in a lot of ways, but anyway, and I, I saw it like, you know, literally, this is how many years since I started all this uh, researching, and I found that Jack Parsons is 555, which is that sort of like Necronomicon Lovecraftian mythos number, which just goes with what Jack Parsons and Kenneth Grant and Crowley were tapping into, it seems. The number 76 itself is quite significant, being as it is the number of will in Hebrew-English gematria, the meaning of the Greek word thelema. It is also the number of ankh, which is the Egyptian word for eternal life, or the immortal principle synonymous with the will. 76 is also the light, and this year, the 111th year of the Eon of Horus, 2015, has been declared the International Year of Light by the United Nations. 111 being itself the number of the white light, which is associated with Kether and Aleph, and again crystallizing into Malkuth, the pure light of manifestation. As has been said, this is the 111th year of the Eon of Horus, and the 76th happened to be 1980 when Kenneth Grant released his fifth book, Outside the Circles of Time which went into more detail regarding Frater Achad's findings regarding the keys of manifestation in Ma Ion. This book cataloged the recurrence of the egg iconography from its first occurrence in Library L, chapter 2, verse 49, for a recurring sevenfold cycle of seven years. And he pretty much specifically talks about these specific numbers, uh, 76, 107, uh, 111, and the whole Kabbalah of Nine Chambers as well. On the 107th year of the Eon of Horus, without my awareness of the significance of the egg or even the slightest importance of Achad's insights into Liber AL, I happened to buy a black obsidian egg on April 2nd. It was not until just within about a week later did I realize when reading Outside the Circles of Time that Achad too had discovered what he did about the egg. Bitsa, the Hebrew word for egg, being 107, the number of Ma'ayon, and this whole, 
in this whole thing regarding the Eon of Mayat, the Akasha Tatwa, or Tatva, on the very same day, which was also his birthday in 1948. And hopefully, uh, Starfire eventually publishes his correspondences that have been referenced as far back as uh, like outside the circles of time. Um, they were supposed to publish it like in 2010. Further synchronicity I've noticed among all of this is that 111 is 35 more than 76. 76 being the verse of the cryptogram, and 35 being the number of ki, kaf, he, yod, or 20 plus 5 plus 10. The 76 ki, and again 76 plus al, is 107. Uh, the 76 key, i.e. 111, unlocks the number of the balance, i.e. the weighing or measuring scales of Mayot. 107, the number of the egg in a various number of ways, as shown throughout this blog, the magic egg, the egg of Doth, an obsidian egg, etc., which is also that of gold and Chrysos, the formula of the Philosopher's Stone, and again is the sum of AL and 76, i.e. the key of the verse 76. This key also opens the hey final, or daughter aspect of the tetragrammaton, which is aligned with the forces of synthesis, regeneration, awakening, and essentially death and dissolution, but again, regeneration, is reminiscent of the fourth state of awareness, Turiya, which is typified as cosmic bliss, or Ananda, which is also 107. The egg is the symbol of the seed, which contains a very deep charge of magical, i.e. Mayak, potential. As has been said by Kabbalists for ages, the Kabbalah of Nine Chambers, or Ike Bakur, which forms the Tree of Life, is a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm, and therefore the blueprint of creation is bound up in the palm. Again, a symbol in which the egg is related in the Amalantra working. And again, the fifth element, Akasha, is symbolized by the black egg. Thus, the black egg is totemic of the eye of the dragon, the O, or Vajra, itself. Realized and awakened, which is not even centered in my talismanic egg, but merely a cosmic symbol of expansion within my own bindi, dot, uh, or dot gnosis. So, I guess what I was saying here is, like, it's not necessarily the physical talisman that is, I guess, I don't know how to say it. I don't know how I was trying to put this, but I guess what I was trying to say is that the egg just simply represents a sort of like a little symbol or a token of something that really isn't there. <laughs> it's just like a, it's the dot, but yet it's that processing point. 111, the white light can also be rendered in Greek as Re, Rho, Alpha, Iota, or Air, Re being the bolt or light of lightning which emanates from not just from Kether but the Ain Sof Or or Limitless Light in its descent to Malkuth, and Air being the element associated with Aleph uh, is obviously also 111. And again, the whole thing about sound, vibration, it's all concomitant. 111 is also the number of the Greek Aenea, 9, and again, the root of the Cabal of Nine Chambers, which is veiled in the numbers 111 through 999. Uh, show, and it shows with the utmost precision how the ancient principles of Kabbalah still apply to the modern English, because essentially that's it's the numerical substructure that is um, what's primarily relevant, I guess, I don't know. In transliterated Hebrew, Greek, Sanskrit, etc., thus aptly the key of it all. Note that the all plus al is also 111, the halexi in Greek, or the word, and the book, uh, or yeah, it's pretty much a book by Andrew Chumley, Q Tub, which is Arabic for the point. 111 veils the three in one and the one in three, which relates to the key of al 31 and a chad one and all and all in one. And again, so, which according to Liber 31 in its original Latin form ended up enumerating to 777 using Hebrew applied to the Latin phrase or English letters. So that's the thing is Achad and Crowley and Grant, it took like slowly for the time, I guess, for them to realize like how this sort of shit would sink in to their very lives and names 
um, Jack Parsons, you know, it's like, uh, which at the time of conceiving of his motto, he, he was not aware. And even I, I just found this and it's funny that I literally put this in here, but didn't realize it until just the other day, but 13 plus 777 plus 31 is 821. This ma ion with an unfinal, which happens to be my birthday. And so, note, 777 is the number of the Hebrew word numla iumum, or with mem final, meaning filled with light. 777 is, of course, also the flaming sword, which descends to charge the Ruach, which crystallizes into Malkuth or manifestation. Exoterically, Malkuth 111 itself is shown with this formula to be a manifestation of the Logos, which in its fullest trine expansion is 999, represents the alignment and the balance, as represented by the truth and justice of Mayot. And see, later I found that the eon of truth and justice and the incoming of the eon of Mayot are all 999. So it's it's just too, too you know, spot on. Even for me to just not wonder, like, what the fuck is going on here? But in Magic, or Book 4, Liber Abba, or Abba, Abba, Page 508 notes for an astral atlas. Crowley notes how he Crowley notes how he received a better spelling of Therion, Greek for the beast, from Amalantra on February 24th of 1918, who gave him the answer. And so he was like asking, and he said, Tau Yod Resh Yod A and Nun, which adds to 740 or 1390, according as Nun is given its ordinary value of 50, or its value is the final letter of a word 700. Neither of these numbers possessed any special significance to the Master Therion. He became very annoyed at Amalantra's failure to be of use, so much so that the communications became confused and the work had to be abandoned for that evening. He tried various other Hebrew spellings for the word Therion, but was unable to obtain anything of interest. This is rather remarkable, as it is nearly always possible to get more or less good results by trying with various possibilities. For example, the Tau might be represented either by Teth or Tau. The O might be equally well Ayin, Vav, or Aleph. I guess I typed this myself, but on Monday morning, the Master Therion went to the office of the International, of which he was editor. At this period, there was a coal famine in New York, and it was forbidden to heat office buildings on Mondays. He merely took away his mail and went home. On Tuesday morning, he found on his desk a letter which had arrived on Monday for the general editor, who had sent it across to him uh, for replay as it concerned the Master Therion rather than himself. This letter had been written and posted on Sunday morning at about the same time as the communication from Amalantra. The letter ends as follows. Please inform your readers that I, Samuel bar Iwaz, be by Yaku de Sharabad, have counted the number of the beast, and it is the number of a man. He gave Therion as Tau, Resh, Yad, and Nun. Here, then, we see the most striking solution of the problem presented to Amalantra, and it came in the form of some mundane letter. Observe that Amalantra had refused to give the correct solution directly, as it would seem, in order to emphasize the remarkable character of the intervention of this Assyrian correspondence, or correspondent. Observe, too, that the latter was totally ignorant of the ordinary Kabbalah, it being quite generally known that two Megatherion adds to 666 in Greek as well. Observe, moreover, that nearly four months had passed since the problem was propounded in the International. The Assyrian, so, it's funny, the Assyrian lived some distance outside of New York and was an entire stranger to any of the staff of the International. The evidence appears overwhelming for the existence of Amalantra, except for the fact that Therion, again, like I've said, or like I later on show and realized, is itself 999, but which... It's just a f further extension of and a sort of solution to the 666 dilemma and all this shit stirred up and started. And that he was further possessed with the power to recall this four months old problem to the mind of an entirely unconnected stranger, causing him to communicate the correct answer at the time moment as uh, the same moment as the question was being asked many miles away. So, and I wouldn't even say that that's evidence of Amalantra that could just be simply... I think that there's, you know, networks of consciousness uh, and subconscious 
like collective unconscious fucking things going on with humanity. There's that's the only it's the only explanation for certain things, I think, but there's clearly something fucking going on. And I think even if it comes down to just the fact that again, the brain functions in a sort of numerical data system. um, That's probably what happens in a lot of cases, like how the mind taps in and, reads and decodes and encodes things spontaneously. The reason I quoted this is because there is a hidden key which was overlooked even by the Master Theory on himself, as well as the editors. And again, Master is 555. John Simons and Kenneth Grant themselves, which is that simply, Therion can not only be 666 as shown above, but also using Hebrew-English gematria. It is precisely 999 using none final and teth, the inverse of 666, which shows the nature of the beast as the dual one, i.e. the double wanted one. 999 has been shown to be the number of the key of it all as well, so like the key of it all applied or just spelled out. And I've also noted elsewhere previously that September 9th of 2009 was the day of my self-initiation, which at the time I had very little knowledge of Crowley and Gematria and no knowledge of the importance of these formulas or 999 itself. To my knowledge, no one else has found very many of these keys except for Freder Achad and later Kenneth Grant, who began finding the first few, then Kenneth Grant, who picked up his work, and a few other adepts here and there who have contributed their insights. But as far as providing these formulas, it is interesting to note that even Crowley, nowhere in his writings, seems to have been aware of the precision of these formulas and their application to Liber AL. I've surveyed all of his writings, as well as those of Achad and Grant, except for, again, what has yet to be published, because I don't really have the time or money to go to England and try and get, like, photocopies of of the Gerald York collection myself. So hopefully, again, they publish him soon. Now that I've said this, they probably won't. They'll probably have another fire. Who knows? And as many others I can find, uh, and no one has even simply seemed to have found that the original title, Liber El Veligis, is 666, which I, I stand corrected now. Apparently someone did mention it online on, a, I think, the Lash Tal forum. But at the same time, they don't like the liberal application of it or the, the application of it to various things, including the subject matter itself. They're just, I mean, it's just weird to me, but the number of the beast and how ironic and how ironic that it is before my publishing of the sword of Zen in 2012, I've even presented this to others and they don't understand and therefore scoff at the idea that something could be so simple as if nothing else has ever been hidden in plain sight or just hidden in plain sight. The question remains, how is this applicable and relevant to our daily lives? Well, in that it unveils more deeply than ever the insights and revelations of Library L, and I think the processes of, again, language itself, as well as many other texts and even entire systems, the combination of Gematria formulas, especially along with the Hebrew-English Gematria formula, and it's, you know, all the shit that's been unlocked because of it, unlocks the underlying meanings and true essential expressions of magical gnosis, which can be more easily apprehended, developed, and guided, i.e. magical exercise. And Michael Berteau has this sort of quote I want to find. All right, so here he says in this book, the Voodoo Gnostic Workbook, page 322, the reduction of voodoo-tronic energies and the EEE energies to magical numbers. Energies do not mean anything unless they exist in the form of magical numbers, unless they exist as powers which can be related to a frame of reference. Again, manifestation. Energies may pro- uh, So unless they exist as powers which can be related to a frame of reference, energies may prove to be illusions. Energies which are hidden and isolated by various occult formularies are revealed as actual potencies once they become numbers. The reason for this is clear. The energies, when they become numbers, reveal the oracular connection to magical entity behind the power. The entity provides us with the agent who sends out the radiations, which we perceive as magical energies. In this physics of the esoteric and the Gnostic, you must find out the true number of each energy and then you can contact the magical entity 
and find out what the spirit wishes from you. Lections of the Master Varuna to Michael Berto. And he goes on and says, The teachings of the Gnostic masters have brought us an insight which is important in seeing how to make use of magical energies. These magical energies are to be converted into magical numbers, and then the numbers will serve as guidelines for making contact with the entities or magical spirits existing behind the energies. And so the numbers are like waypoints or um, digital nodes of manifestation. It may also be seen that the energies are sent out from magical spirits and that this terminology is going to trigger a lot of people. It may also be seen that the energies are sent out from magical spirits and that each energization has in its field of radiation certain keys which, when understood in the light of the Gnosis, provide us with the spirit and its family, from which the powers are understood to emanate. There are four stages in this process of magical reduction. One, identify the type of energy. Two, the process of magical reduction to a number between one and nine, which is a threefold process. Three, the identification of the magical energy and its family by means of oracular languages. And four, commence dialogue with the magical entity via the system of magical communications. And all this term, the term magical, is going to, again, trigger a lot of people. Um, but you just have to read his book and, and Kenneth Grant, and you'll realize, like, magic is essentially literally just... Uh, the movement of the mind through time. The entire purpose of this system is to create methods of correcting problems which arrive from the negative operations of certain magical currents by the Gnostic method of magical replacement, whereby a negative energy is replaced by a positive energy and pattern of consciousness. And so in a way, like I do this, which magical problem solving by this technique can be then can then be carried out with greater and greater efficiency than allowed by previous methods. Like, I use the gematria and numerology as essentially to get a blueprint of any sort of subject and then fill in the gaps. Like, it's it's like a puzzle. And I think that there's a, like, with computational biology and bioinformatics and study of pretty much DNA and molecule, like, you could probably discover cures for cancer and um, not with just gematria alone, but again, by blueprinting existing data sets and then filling in the blanks. And like, if you have a question, you extrapolate it. So for whatever reason, though, I think that the fact like it's symbolic, not just symbolic, but it's just so telling that the motivations to really progress Kind of, I mean, I don't know. There's political and mental issues, I think, at large that prevent this from happening. But anyway, it is so important to realize at this point that numbers are themselves communicators of another energy, that of synchronicity, which translates the energies of the voodoo tronic system to a higher level of operations. This process is discussed by the master. The energies of any system, when they are reduced to numbers and the patterns of numbers, convey not only precision and greater Gnostico-magical management, but they induct by the very process of reduction an abstract and higher energy, which is also more concrete and continuous, because it holds events together and is the medium whereby they can come about and pass from one state to another, and that is synchronicity, as it is called in Jungian magico metaphysics for the operations of all magical processes are given in experience and governed by this process of energy organization or the pattern of how things happen. And again, everyday experiences is 999. But there is also an energy in this happening, which is the energy governing all of the other energies in this in the system and all of the systems linked together in the continuum of Gnostic physics. So again, and all these systems are getting linked. Um, so I just wanted to pull that up because it's been in my mind and it seemed to fit. But but I know the terminology 
isn't the best. But I think that, again, there is a sort of, that's what the key of it all, that's what the, that's how it's applicable and relevant is it's simply the system of reverse engine. It's like a way of reverse engineering language and thought and then being able to alter it. And obviously like, going back to the 1066 thing and language even further, which, I mean, there's all these books, like in all these different things I could refer to. Crowley obviously did a lot of the groundwork and I don't know why they didn't publish his Greek geometry or isopsophy library 1264 um, in 777. They should have, but there's all those. Of course, I've referenced The Apocalypse Unsealed by James Price and his other books that reference the Kabbalah of Nine Chambers, but it's all in Greek. Um, Materials for the Apostolic Study of the Gnosis also talks about this like ancient use of Gematria, but mainly in Greek, as well as the Canon, which Crowley refers to, or refer- like he uh, recommends, also mainly in, pretty much exclusively in Greek. Uh, Library of Allegiance, like, it makes you wonder when you realize, like, because I had no idea, like, I've slowly been studying this for years, and in high school, I had to learn about Shakespeare and British literature, and I had no idea how much this sort of, like, history goes back of cryptology in his writings, and the speculations as, like, if Francis Bacon or even Richard Burton, or what's the name, Robert Burton, the author of The Anatomy of Melancholy. Uh, I have a book by this person named Alexander Brownlee, and he tries to say that uh, Robert Burton at least like had a hand in Shakespeare's writings, and that's what I get from all this, is like I think Shakespeare was probably just like rubbing shoulders with a lot of different people and was influenced, and but I don't think he was... Like, I don't think he, I don't think Francis Bacon was his true identity or anything, but when you study this whole subject, it's very, very intriguing. Uh, And I've slow, like, I just slowly stumbled onto this. And when even applying, again, this, the key of it all, or just the various ciphers to um, this subject, a lot of, a lot of things just quickly come up, like, just really weird there's all this stuff that i want to kind of get into except i know it'd take a lot of time uh but this whole i mean cryptography the word cryptography comes to mind because it it too is cryptography with just a pay though it's kind of like a hidden cryptogram or cryptograph itself uh or just cryptograph with a, I guess a chef, but, um, cryptography, it's just weird. Like that's literally what this is. People have known about it, but yet it's demonized, but it, well, obviously because it's abused, I guess. So States, the most consequential cryptographic advancements happened around the Japanese code called Purple. And the man who broke Purple was William Friedman. William Friedman did not start by studying 20th century codes. He started by studying Edgar Allan Poe, William Shakespeare, and Sir Francis Bacon. And his first work in learning about how codes and ciphers work came through a systematic introduction to the writings of Sir Francis Bacon. 
that was very much uh, designed to serve a project that he himself did not believe in, which was to try to prove that Bacon had written Shakespeare's plays and had left behind coded messages saying that. And all of a sudden, they are turned to by the government to not only break uh, ciphered documents that were being sent to them, but to use Bacon and these 16th, 17th century techniques to teach a whole new generation of military, practical, mathematically driven code breakers. And Friedman leads this team who he has trained and taught to break the Japanese code. The Bacon Shakespeare controversy with the teaching of Sir Francis Bacon in particular, those absolutely changed the course of the 20th century. So again, it's 2015. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this whole subject to me is just really interesting, and I'm surprised I didn't know about it until literally this whole year, this year. Um... Because I didn't really care for Shakespeare, I had to learn, watch, read, listen to, and you know, study that, and it, to me, it was just boring. But now I realize, like, maybe they were putting shit in there, like, so that you, like, I don't know, it's like Shakespeare's dramas and stories seem to have a sort of like an underlying message to them, and I wouldn't doubt if there was some sort of like Kabbalistic or Rosicrucian knowledge. Uh, Manly P. Hall talks about it, and not just in Secret Teachings of All Ages, but also The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny, and probably others. I don't have all of his books, but um, here he says, The present considerations of the Bateshear... There is a book called Bateshear... Uh, fucking Bateshear. There, uh, there is a book called Bacon, Shakespeare, and the Rosicrucians as well, but the, the present consideration of the Bacon-Shakespeare-Rosicrucian controversy is undertaken not for the vain purpose of digging up dead men's bones, but rather in the hope that a critical analysis will aid in the rediscovery of that knowledge lost to the world since the oracles were silenced. It was F or W. F. C. Winston who called the Bard of Avon Phantom, Cap Phantom Captain Shakespeare the Rosicrucian Mask. This constitutes one of the most significant statements relating to the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy. It is quite evident that William Shakespeare could not, unaided, have produced the immortal writings bearing his name. He did not possess the necessary literary culture for the town of Stratford, where he was reared, contained no school capable of imparting the higher forms of learning reflected in the writings ascribed to him. His parents were illiterate, and in his early life he evinced a total disregard for study. There are in existence but six known examples of Shakespeare's handwriting. All are signatures, and three of them are, are in his will. The scrawling, uncertain method of their execution stamps Shakespeare as unfamiliar with the use of a pen, and it is obvious either that he copied a signature prepared for him, or that his hand was guided while he wrote. No autograph manuscripts of the Shakespearean plays or sonnets have been discovered, nor is there even a tradition concerning them other than the fantastic and impossible statement appeared in the foreword of the Great Folio. A well-stocked library would be an essential part of the equipment of an author whose literary productions demonstrate him to be familiar with the literature of all ages, yet there is no record that Shakespeare ever possessed a library, nor does he make any mention of books in his will. Commenting on the known illiteracy of Shakespeare's daughter Judith, who at 27 could only make her mark, Ignatius Donnelly declares it to be unbelievable that William Shakespeare, if he wrote the plays bearing his name, would have permitted his own daughter to reach womanhood and marry without being able to uh, read one line of the writings that made her father wealthy and locally famous. The query has also been raised. Where did William Shakespeare secure his knowledge of modern French, Italian, Spanish, and Danish to say nothing of classical Latin and Greek? For, in spite of the rare discrimination with which Latin is used by the author of Shakespearean plays, Ben Jonson, who knew Shakespeare intimately, declared that the Stratford actor understood small Latin and less Greek. Is it not also more than strange that no record exists of William Shakespeare's having ever played a leading role in the famous dramas he is supposed to have written, or in others produced by the company of which he was a member? 
True, he may have owned a small interest in the Globe Theater or Blackfriars, but apparently the height of the, his thespian achievements uh, was the ghost in Hamlet. In spite of his admitted avarice, Shakespeare seemingly made no effort during his lifetime to control or secure remuneration for the plays bearing his name, many of which were first published anonymously. As far as can be ascertained, none of his heirs were involved in any manner whatever in the printing of the first folio after his death, nor did they benefit financially therefrom. Had he been their author, Shakespeare's manuscripts and unpublished plays would certainly have constituted his most valued possessions, yet his will, while making special disposition of his second best bed in his broad silver gilt bowl, neither mentions nor intimates that he possessed any literary productions whatsoever. While the folios and quartos usually are signed William Shakespeare, all the known autographs of the Stratford actor read William Shakespeare with an, just an E, no A. Does this change in spelling contain any significance heretofore generally overlooked? Furthermore, if the publishers of the first Shakespearean folio revered their fellow actor as much as their claim in the volume would indicate, why did they, as if ironical allusion to a hoax which they were perpetrating, place an evident caricature of him on the title page. Certain absurdities also in Shakespeare's private life are irreconcilable. While supposedly at the zenith of his literary career, he was actually engaged in buying malt, presumably for a brewing business. Also picture the immortal Shakespeare, the reputed author of The Merchant of Venice, as a moneylender. Yet among those whom Shakespeare brought action to collect petty sums was a fellow townsman, one Philip Rogers, whom he sued for an unpaid loan of two shillings, or about 48 cents. In short, there is nothing known in the life of Shakespeare that would justify the literary excellence imputed to him. The philosophic ideals promulgated throughout the Shakespearean plays distinctly demonstrate their author to have been thoroughly familiar with the certain doctrines and tenets peculiar to Rosicrucianism. In fact, the profundity of the Shakespearean production stamps their creator as one of the Illuminati of the ages. Most of those seeking a solution for the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy have been intellectualists. Notwithstanding their scholarly attainments, they have overlooked the important part played by transcendentalism in the philosophic achievements of the ages. The mysteries of superphysics are inexplicable to the materialist whose training does not equip him to estimate the extent of their ramifications and complexities. Yet who but a Platonist, a Kabbalist, or a Pythagorean could have written The Tempest, Macbeth, Hamlet, or The Tragedy of Cymbeline? Who but one deeply versed in Paracelsian lore could have conceived A Midsummer Night's Dream? Father of Modern Science, Remodeler uh, of Modern Law, Editor of the Modern Bible, Patron of Modern Democracy, and one of the founders of Modern Freemasonry, Sir Francis Bacon, was a man of many aims and purposes, so I guess he does think that it was probably Bacon. I don't necessarily think that it would have to be, but he was a Rosicrucian. Some have intimated the Rosicrucian, if not actually the illustrious father, CRC, or Christian Rosenkreutz, referred to in the Rosicrucian Manifestos. He was certainly a high initiate of the Rosicrucian order, and it is his activities in connection with this secret body that are of prime importance to students of symbolism, philosophy, and literature. So, and again, like, regardless of who, or if he did, if whether or not he did, the whole subject is very interesting. Like, Bacon's life and books. Scores of volumes have been written to establish Sir Francis Bacon as the real author of the plays and sonnets popularly ascribed to William Shakespeare. An impartial consideration of these documents cannot but convince the open-minded of the verisimilitude of the Baconian theory. In fact, those enthusiasts who, for years, have struggled to identify Sir Francis Bacon as the true bard of Avon might long since have won their case had they emphasized its most important angle, namely that Sir Francis Bacon, the Rosicrucian initiate, who wrote into the Shakespearean plays the secret teachings of the fraternity of uh, R.C., and the true rituals of the Freemasonic order, of which order it may be yet discovered that he was the actual founder. <laughs> a sentimental world, however, dislikes to give up a traditional hero, either to solve a controversy or to right a wrong. Nevertheless, if it can be proved that by raveling out the riddle there can be discovered information of practical value to mankind, 
then the best minds of the world will cooperate in the enterprise. The Bacon-Shakespeare controversy, as its most stable advocates realize, involves the most profound aspects of science, religion, and ethics. He who solves its mystery may yet find therein the key to the supposedly lost wisdom of antiquity. It was in recognition of Bacon's intellectual accomplishments that King James turned over to him the translator's manuscripts of what is now known as the King James Bible, for the presumable purpose of checking, editing, and revising them. The documents remained in his hands for nearly a year, but no information is to be had concerning what occurred at, in that time. Regarding this work, William T. Smedley writes, It will eventually be proved that the whole scheme of the authorized version of the Bible was Francis Bacon's. See the mystery of Francis Bacon. The first edition of the King James Bible contains a cryptic Baconian headpiece. Did Bacon cryptographically conceal the authorized Bible, or in the authorized Bible, that which he dared not literally reveal in the text, the secret Rosicrucian key to mystic and Masonic Christianity? Sir Francis Bacon unquestionably possessed the range of general and philosophical knowledge necessary to write the Shakespearean plays and sonnets, for it is usually conceded that he was a composer, lawyer, and linguist. His chaplain, Dr. William Raleigh and Ben Johnson, both attest his philosophic and poetic accomplishments. The former pays Bacon his remarkable tribute. I have been induced to think that if there were a beam of knowledge derived from God upon any man in these modern times, it was upon him. For though he was a great reader of books, he had not his knowledge from books, but from some grounds and notions from within himself. See Introduction to the Resuscitato. Sir Francis Bacon, being not only an able barrister, but also a polished courtier, also possessed that intimate knowledge of parliamentary law and the etiquette of the royal court revealed in the Shakespearean plays, which could scarcely have been acquired by a man in the humble station of the Stratford actor. Lord Verulam furthermore visited many of the foreign countries forming the background for the plays and was therefore in a position to create the authentic local atmosphere contained therein but there is no record of William Shakespeare's ever having traveled outside of England. The magnificent library amassed by Sir Francis Bacon can <laughs> The magnificent library amassed by Sir Francis Bacon contained the very volumes necessary to supply the quotations and anecdotes incorporated into the Shakespearean plays. Many of the plays, in fact, were taken from plots in earlier writings of which there was no English translation at the time, or at that time. Because of his scholastic acquirements, Lord Verulam could have read the original books. It is most unlikely that William Shakespeare could have done so. Abundant cryptographic proof exists that Bacon was concerned in the production of the Shakespearean plays. Sir Francis Bacon's cipher number was 33. In the first part of King Henry IV, the word Francis appears 33 times upon one page. To attain this end, obviously awkward sentences were required as Anon Francis? No, Francis, but tomorrow Francis, or Francis on Thursday, or indeed Francis when thou wilt, but Francis. Throughout the, <laughs> throughout the Shakespearean folios and quartos occurs uh, scores of acrostic signatures. The simplest form of the acrostic is that whereby a name, in these instances Bacon's, was hidden in the first few letters of lines. In The Tempest, Act 1, Scene 2, appears a striking example of the Baconian acrostic. Begun to tell me what I am, but stopped, and left me... Uh, so you got... Uh, you can't really see it, but... B-A-C... The first letters of the first and second lines together with the first three letters of the third line form the word Bacon. Similar acrostics appear frequently in Bacon's acknowledged writings. The tenor of the Shakespearean dramas politically is in harmony with the recognized viewpoints of Sir Francis Bacon, whose enemies are frequently caricatured in the plays. Likewise, their religious, philosophic, and educational undercurrents all reflect his personal opinions. Not only do these marked similarities of style and terminology exist in Bacon's writings in the Shakespearean plays, but there are also certain historical and philosophical inaccuracies common to both, such as identical misquotations from Aristotle. Evidently realizing that futurity would unveil his full genius, Lord Verulam, in his will, bequeathed his soul to God above by the oblations of his Savior. 
his body to be buried obscurely, his name and memory to men's charitable speeches to foreign nations to succeeding ages, and to his own countrymen after some time had elapsed. That portion appearing in italics, Bacon deleted from his will, apparently fearing that he said too much. That Sir Francis Bacon's subterfuge was known to a limited few during his lifetime is quite evident. Accordingly, stray hints regarding the true author of the Shakespearean plays may be found in many 17th century volumes. On page 33, Bacon cipher number, the 1609 edition of Robert Codry's Treasury or Storehouse, the curious volume from which this figure is taken was published in Paris uh, in, I guess, 1680. The attention of the Baconian student is immediately attracted by the form of the hog in the foreground. Bacon often used this animal as a play upon his own name, especially because the name Bacon was derived from the word beech, and the nut of this tree was used to fatten hogs. The two pillars in the background have considerable Masonic interest. The two A's nearly in the center of the picture, one light and one shaded, are alone almost conclusive proof of Baconian influence. The most convincing evidence, however, is the fact that 17 is the numerical equivalent of the letters of the Latin form of Bacon's name, F. Bacco. Lord Bacon was born in 1561, and history records his death in 1626. There are records in existence, however, which would indicate the probability that his funeral was a mock funeral, and that leaving England he lived for many years under another name in Germany, and there faithfully serving the secret society <laughs> there, faith there faithfully serving the secret society to the promulgation of whose doctrines he had consecrated his life. Little doubt seems to exist in the minds of impartial investigators that Lord Bacon was the legitimate son of Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester. On page 33 of the 1609 edition of Robert Codry's Treasury or Storehouse of Similes appears the following significant allusion. Like as men would laugh at a poor man, if having precious garments lent him the act and play the part of some honorable personage upon a stage, when the play were at an end, he should keep them as his own and brag up and down in them. Repeated references to the word hog in the presence of cryptographic statements on page 33 of various contemporary writings demonstrate that the keys to Bacon's ciphers were his own name, words playing upon it, or its numerical equivalent. Notable examples are the famous statement of Mistress Quickly in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Hang hog is Latin for bacon, I warrant you. The title pages of The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia and Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen and the emblems appearing in the words of Alciatus and Wither. Furthermore, the word honorific calituted dinitatibus, appearing in the fifth act of Love's Labor's Lost, is a Rosicrucian signature, as its numerical equivalent, 287, indicates. And 287 is secret. I know that just from immediate memory. Uh, secret when you apply Hebrew to English. Again, on the title page of the first edition of Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, Father Time is depicted bringing a female figure out of the darkness of a cave. Around the device is a Latin inscription, In time the secret truth shall be revealed. The, catch <laughs> the catchwords and printer's devices appearing in volumes published especially during the first half of the 17th century were designed, arranged, and in some cases mutilated according to a definite plan. It is also evident that the mispaginations in the Shakespearean folios and other volumes are keys to Baconian ciphers, for re-editions, often from new type and by different printers, contain the same mistakes. For example, the first and second folios of Shakespeare are printed from entirely different type and by different printers nine years apart, but in both editions, page 153 of the comedies is numbered 151, and pages 249 and 250 are numbered 250 and 251, respectively. Also, in the 1640 edition of Bacon's The Advancement and Proficience of Learning, pages 353 and 354 are numbered 351 and 352, respectively. And in the 1641 edition of Dubarta's Divine Weeks, pages 346 and 350 inclusive are entirely missing, while page 450 is numbered 442. The frequency with which pages ending in numbers 50, 51, 52, 53, and 54 are involved will be noted. Uh, 
The requirements of Lord Verulam's bilateral cipher are fully met in scores of volumes printed between 1590 and 1650 and in some printed at other times. An examination of the verses by L. Diggs, dedicated to the memory of the deceased author Meister W. Shakespeare, reveals the use of two fonts of type for both capital and small letters, the differences being most marked in the capital T's, N's, and A's. See the first folio. The cipher has been deleted from subsequent editions. The presence of hidden material in the text is often indicated by needless involvement of words. On the 16th unnumbered page of the 1641 edition of Dubartus Divine Weeks is a boar surmounting a pyramidal text. The text is meaningless jargon, evidently inserted for cryptographic reasons and marked with Bacon's signature, the hog. The year following publication of the first folio of Shakespeare's plays in 1623, there was printed in Luneburg a remarkable volume on cryptography avowedly by Gustavus Salinas. It is considered extremely probable that this volume constitutes the cryptographic key to the great, sh to the great Shakespearean folio. Peculiar symbolic Peculiar symbolic head and tail pieces also mark the presence of cryptograms. While such ornaments are found in early printed books, great emblems are peculiar to volumes containing Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. The light and dark shaded A is an interesting example. Bearing in mind the frequent recurrence in Baconian symbolism of the light and dark shaded A and the hog, the following statement by Bacon in his interpretation of nature is highly significant. If the sow with her snout should happen to imprint the letter A upon the ground, wouldst thou therefore imagine that she could write out a whole tragedy as one letter? <laughs> the Rosicrucians and other secret societies of the 17th century used watermarks as mediums for the conveyance of cryptographic references. In books presumably containing Baconian ciphers are usually printed upon paper bearing Rosicrucian or Masonic watermarks. Often there are several symbols in one book, such as the Rose Cross, urns, bunches of grapes, and others. At hand is a document which may prove a remarkable key to a cipher beginning uh, in the tragedy of Cymbeline. So far as known, it has never been published and is applicable only to the 1623 folio of Shakespearean plays. The cipher is a line and word count involving punctuation especially the long and short exclamation points and the straight and slanting interrogation points. This code was discovered by William Henry Burse in 1900, and after it has been thoroughly checked, its exact nature will be made public. No reasonable doubt remains that the Masonic Order is the direct outgrowth of the secret societies of the Middle Ages, nor can it be denied that Freemasonry is permeated by the symbolism and mysticism of the ancient and medieval worlds. Sir Francis Bacon knew the true secret of Masonic origin, and there is reason to suspect that he concealed this knowledge in cipher and cryptogram. Bacon is not to be regarded solely as a man, but rather as the focal point between an invisible institution and a world which was never able to distinguish between the messenger and the message which he promulgated. This secret society, having rediscovered the lost wisdom of the ages, and fearing that the knowledge might be lost again, perpetuated in two ways. One, by an organization, Freemasonry, to the initiate of which it revealed its wisdom in the form of symbols. Two, by embodying its arcana in the literature of the day by means of cunningly contrived ciphers and enigmas. Evidence points to the existence of a group of wise and illustrious freighters, or brothers, uh, who assumed the responsibility of publishing and preserving for future generations the choicest of the secret books of the ancients, together with certain other documents which they themselves had prepared, that future members of their fraternity might not only identify these volumes, but also immediately note their significant passages, words, chapters, or sections therein, they created a symbolic alphabet of hieroglyphic designs. By means of a secret key and order, the discerning few were thus enabled to find that wisdom by which a man is raised to an illumined life. The tremendous import of the Baconian mystery is daily becoming more apparent. Sir Francis Bacon was a link in that great chain of minds which has perpetuated the secret doctrine of antiquity from its beginning. 
This secret doctrine is concealed in his cryptic writings. The search for this divine wisdom is the only legitimate motive for the effort to decode his cryptograms. Masonic research might discover much of value if it would turn its attention to certain volumes published during the 16th and 17th centuries which bear the stamp and signet of that secret society whose members first established modern Freemasonry, but themselves remained as an intangible group controlling and directing the activities of the outer body. The unknown history and lost rituals of Freemasonry may be rediscovered in the symbolism and cryptograms of the Middle Ages. Freemasonry is the bright and glorious son of a mysterious and hidden father. It cannot trace its parentage because its origin is obscured by the veil of the superphysical and the mystical. The Great Folio of 1623 is a veritable treasure house of Masonic lore and symbolism. And the time is at hand when the great work should be accorded the consideration which is its due. Though Christianity shattered the material organization of the pagan mysteries, it could not destroy the knowledge of supernatural power which the pagans possessed. Therefore, it is known that the mysteries of Greece and Egypt were secretly perpetuated through the early centuries of the church, and later, by being clothed in the symbolism of Christianity, were accepted as elements of that faith. Sir Francis Bacon was one of those who had been entrusted with the perpetuation and dissemination of the arcana of the superphysical, originally in the possession of the pagan Arifants, and to attain that end either formulated the fraternity of R.C. or was admitted into an organization already existing under that name and became one of its principal representatives. For some reason not apparent to the uninitiated, there has been a continued and consistent effort to prevent the unraveling of the Baconian scheme. Whatever the power may be which continually blocks the efforts of investigators, it is unremitting now as it was immediately following Bacon's death, and those attempting to solve the enigma still feel the weight of its resentment. A misunderstanding world has ever persecuted those who understood the secret workings of nature, seeking in every conceivable manner to exterminate the custodians of this divine wisdom. Sir Francis Bacon's political prestige was finally undermined, and Sir Walter Raleigh met a shameful fate because their transcendental knowledge was considered dangerous. The forging of Shakespeare's handwriting, the foisting of fraudulent portraits and death masks upon a gullible public, the fabrication of spurious biographies, the mutilation of books and documents, the destruction or rendering illegible of tablets and inscriptions containing cryptographic messages— have all compounded the difficulties attendant upon the solution of the Bacon-Shakespeare-Rosicrucian riddle. The Ireland forgeries deceived experts for years. According to material available, the Supreme Council of the Fraternity of R.C. was composed of a certain number of individuals who had died what is known as the philosophic death. When the time came for an initiate to enter upon his labors for the order, he conveniently died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. In reality, he changed his name and place of residence, and a box of rocks or body secured for the purpose was buried in his stead. It is believed that this happened in the case of Sir Francis Bacon, who, like all servants of the mysteries, renounced all personal credit and permitted others to be considered as the authors of the documents which he wrote or inspired. The cryptic writings of Francis Bacon constitute one of the most powerful tangible elements in the mysteries of transcendentalism and symbolic philosophy. Apparently many years must yet pass before an uncomprehending world will appreciate the transcending genius of that mysterious man who wrote the Novum Organum, who sailed his little ship far out into the unexplored sea of learning through the pillars of Hercules and whose ideals for a new civilization are magnificently expressed in the utopian dream of the new Atlantis. Was Sir Francis Bacon a second Prometheus? Did his great love for the people of the world and his pity for their ignorance cause him to bring the divine fire from heaven concealed within the contents of a printed page? In all probability, the keys to the Baconian riddle will be found in classical mythology. He who understands the secret of the seven-rayed god will comprehend the method employed by Bacon to accomplish his monumental labor. Aliases were assumed by him in accordance with the attributes and order of the members of the planetary system. 
One of the least known but most important keys to the Baconian Enigma is the third, or 1637 edition, published in Paris, of Les Images ou Tableau des Plates Peintures de, de du Philostrates Sophistes Grets et les Statues de Calistrate by Blaise de Visionnaire. The, temple, uh, the title page of this volume, which as the name of the author when properly deciphered indicates, was written by or under the direction of Bacon or his secret society in one mass of important Masonic or Rosicrucian symbols. On page 486 appears a plate entitled Hercules Furio, showing a gigantic figure shaking a spear the ground before him strewn with curious emblems. In his curious work, Das Bild des Splierschutters die Losung de Shakespeare Ratzels, Alfred Frund attempts to explain the Baconian symbolism in the Philostrates. Bacon, he reveals as the philosophical Hercules, who time, whom time will establish as the true spear shaker, Shakespeare. What was the mysterious knowledge? knowledge what was the mysterious knowledge which Sir Walter Raleigh possessed and which was declared to be detrimental to the British government? Why was he executed when the charges against him could not be proved? Was he a member of me or what the of those feared and uh, hated secret societies which nearly overthrew political and religious Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries? Was Sir Walter Raleigh an important factor in the Bacon Shakespeare Rosicrucian Masonic enigma, enigma? By those seeking the keys to this great controversy, he seems to have been almost entirely overlooked. So, this next uh, chapter is actually really interesting, too, because it goes into this, the cryptogram. So, it's the cryptogram as a factor in symb symbolic philosophy. And it says, no treatise which deals with symbolism would be complete without a section devoted to the consideration of cryptograms. The use of ciphers has long been recognized as indispensable in military and diplomatic circles, but the modern world has overlooked the important role played by cryptography in literature and philosophy. If the art of deciphering cryptograms could be made popular, it would result in the discovery of much hitherto unsuspected wisdom possessed by both ancient and medieval philosophers. It would prove that many apparent verbose and rambling authors were wordy for the sake of concealing words. Ciphers are hidden in the most subtle manner. They may be concealed in the watermark of the paper upon which a book is printed. They may be bound into the covers of ancient books. They may be hidden under imperfect pagination. They may be abstracted from the first letters of words or the first words of sentences. They may be artfully concealed in mathematical equations or in apparently or in apparently unintelligible characters. They may be extracted from the jargon of clowns, or revealed by heat as having been written in sympathetic ink. They may be word ciphers, letter ciphers, or apparently ambiguous statements whose meanings could be understood only by repeated careful readings. They may be discovered in the elaborately illuminated initial letters of early books, or they may be revealed by a process of counting words or letters. If those interested in Freemasonic research would give serious consideration to this subject, they might find in books and manuscripts of the 16th and 17th centuries the information necessary to bridge the gap in Masonic history that now exists between the mysteries of the ancient world and the craft masonry of the last three centuries. The arcana of the ancient mysteries were never revealed to the profane except through the media of symbols. Symbolism fulfilled the dual office of concealing the sacred truths from the uninitiated and revealing them to those qualified to understand the symbols. Forms are the symbols of formless divine principles. Symbolism is the language of nature. With reverence, the wise pierce the veil, and with clearer vision contemplate the reality. But the ignorant, unable to distinguish between the false and the true, behold a universe of symbols. Hmm. Simulacra. It may well be said of nature, the great mother, that she is ever tracing strange characters upon the surface of things, but only to her eldest and wisest sons as a reward for their faith and devotion does she reveal the cryptic alphabet which is the key to the import of these tracings. The temples of the ancient mysteries evolved their own sacred languages, known only to their initiates and never spoke save in the sanctuary. 
the illumined priests considered it sacrilege to discuss the sacred truths of the higher worlds or the divine verities of eternal nature in the same tongue as that used by the vulgar for wrangling and dissension. A sacred science must needs be couched in a sacred language. Secret alphabets also were invented, and whenever the secrets of the wise were committed to writing, characters meaningless to the uninformed were employed. Such forms of writing were called sacred or hermetic alphabets. Some such as the famous angelic writing are still retained in the higher degrees of masonry. Secret alphabets were not entirely satisfactory, however, for although they rendered unintelligible the true nature of the writings, their very presence disclosed the fact of concealed information, which the priests also sought to conceal. Through patience or persecution, the keys to these alphabets were eventually acquired and the contents of the documents revealed to the unworthy. This necessitated employment of more subtle methods for concealing the divine truths. The result was the appearance of cryptic systems of writing designed to conceal the presence of both the message and the cryptogram. Having thus devised a method of transmitting their secrets to posterity, the Illuminati encouraged the circulation of certain documents specially prepared through incorporating into them ciphers containing, uh, containing the deepest secrets of mysticism and philosophy. Thus, medieval philosophers disseminated their theories throughout Europe without evoking suspicion, since volumes containing these cryptograms could be subjected to the closest scrutiny without revealing the presence of the hidden message. During the Middle Ages, scores of writers, members of secret political or religious organizations, published books containing ciphers. Secret writing became a fad. Every European court had its own diplomatic cipher, and the intelligentsia viewed with one another in devising curious and complicated cryptograms. The literature of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries is permeated with ciphers, few of which have ever been decoded. Many of the magnificent scientific and philosophical intellects of this period dared not publish their findings because of the religious intolerance of their day. In order to preserve the fruitage of their own intellectual labors for mankind, these pioneers of progress concealed their discoveries in ciphers, trusting that future generations, more kindly than their own, would discover and appreciate their learning. Many churchmen, it is interesting to note, used cryptograms fearing excommunication or a worse fate should their scientific researches be, su be suspected. Only recently, an intricate cipher of Roger Bacon's has been unraveled, revealing the fact that this early scientist was well-versed in the cellular theory. Lecturing before the American Philosophical Society, Dr. William Romain Newbold, who translated the cipher manuscript of the, fr of the friar, declared, there are drawings which so accurately portray the actual appearance of certain objects that it is difficult to resist the inference that Bacon had seen them with the microscope. These are spermatozoa, the body cells, and the, and the seminiferous tubes, the ova, with their nuclei distinctly indicated. There are nine large drawings, of which one at least bears considerable resemblance to a certain stage of development of a fertilized cell. See Review of Reviews, July 1921. Had Roger Bacon failed to conceal this discovery under a complicated cipher, he would have been persecuted as a heretic and would probably have met the fate of other uh, early liberal thinkers. In spite of the rapid progress made by science in the last 250 years, it still remains ignorant concerning many of the original discoveries made by medieval investigators. The only record of these important findings is that contained in the cryptograms of the volumes which they published. While many authors have written on the subject of cryptography, the books most valuable to the students of philosophy and religion are Polygraphia and Steganographia by Trithemius, Abbot of Spanheim, Mercury or the Secret and Swift Messenger by John Wilkins, Bishop of Chester, Oedipus Egypticus and other works by Athanasius Kircher, Society of Jesus, and Cryptomenitesis et Cryptographiae by Gustavus Salinas. To illustrate the basic differences in their construction and use, the various forms of ciphers are here uh, grouped under several general headings. One, one, the literal cipher, the most famous of all literal ciphers, is the famous bilateral cipher described by uh, Sir Francis Bacon in his De Augmentis Scientarium. Lord Bacon originated 
the system while still a young man residing in Paris. The bilateral cipher requires the use of two styles of type, one of an ordinary face and the other specially cut. The differences between the two fonts are in many cases so minute that it requires a powerful magnifying glass to detect them. Originally, the cipher messages were concealed only in the italicized words, sentences, or paragraphs because the italic letters, being more ornate than the Roman letters, offered greater opportunity for concealing the slight but necessary variations. Sometimes the letters vary a trifle in size, at other times in thickness or in ornamental flourishes. Later, Lord Bacon is believed to have had two Roman alphabets specially prepared in which the differences were so trivial that it is almost impossible for experts to distinguish them. A careful inspection of the first four Shakespeare folios discloses the use throughout the volumes of several styles of different of type differing in minute but distinguishable details. It is possible that all the Shakespeare folios contain ciphers running through the text. These ciphers may have been added to the original plays, which are much longer in the folios than in the original quartos, full scenes having been added in some instances. The bilateral cipher was not confined to the writings of Bacon and Shakespeare, however, but appears in many books published during Lord Bacon's lifetime and for nearly a century after his death. In referring to the bilateral cipher, Lord Bacon terms it omnia per omnia. The cipher may run through an entire book and it placed and be placed therein at the time of printing without the knowledge of the original author, for it does not necessitate the changing of either words or punctuation. It is possible that this cipher was inserted for political purposes into many documents and volumes published during the 17th century. It is well known that ciphers were used for the same reason as early as the Council of Nicaea. The Baconian bilateral cipher is difficult to use today owing to the present exact standardization of type and the fact that so few books are now handset. Accompanying this chapter are facsimiles of Lord Bacon's bilateral alphabet as it appeared in the 1640 English translation of De Augmentis Scientarium. Scientarum. Scientiarum. There are four alphabets, two for the capital and two for the small letters. Consider carefully the differences between these four and note that each alphabet has the power of either the letter A or the letter B, and that when reading a word, its letters are divisible into one of two groups, those which correspond to the letter A and those which correspond to the letter B. In order to employ the bilateral cipher, a document must contain five times as many letters as there are in the cipher message to be concealed, for it requires five letters to conceal one. The bilateral cipher somewhat resembles a telegraph code in which letters are changed into dots and dashes. According to the bilateral system, however, the dots and dashes are represented respectively by A's and B's. The word bilateral is derived from the fact that all the letters of the alphabet may be reduced to either A or B. An example of bilateral writing is shown in one of the accompanying diagrams. In order to demonstrate the working of this cipher, the message concealed within the words, wisdom and understanding are more to be desired than riches, will now be deciphered. The first step is to discover uh, the letters of each alphabet and replace them by their equivalent A or B in accordance with the key given by Lord Bacon in his bilateral alphabet. In the word wisdom, the W is from the B alphabet, therefore it is replaced by a B. The I is from the A alphabet, therefore an A is put in its place. The S is also from the A alphabet, but the D belongs to the uh, B alphabet. The O and the M both belong to the A alphabet, um, is replaced by A. By this process, the word wisdom becomes B-A-A-B-A-A. -A -A -B -A -A. Treating the remaining words of the sentence in a similar manner and becomes A-B-A, -A, understanding A-A-A-B-A-A-A, A-A-A-B-A-B, R, A-B-A, more A-B-B-B, A-B-B-B, to a b b a b desired a b a a b a a then a a b a and riches a a a a a a the next step is to run all the letters together <laughs> thus b a blah 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 all of the combinations used in the baconian bilateral cipher consist of groups containing five letters each therefore the solid line of letters must be broken into groups of five in the following manner 
B-A-A-B-A, A-A-B-A-A, etc. Each of these groups of five letters now represents one letter of the cipher, and the actual letter can be determined by comparing the groups with the alphabetical table, the key to the bilateral cipher from De Augmentis Scientiarum. So T-E-E-B-L-P-X-E-E-A. But the last five letters of the word riches being set off from a period from the initial R, the last five A's do not count in the cipher. The letters thus extracted are now brought together in order, resulting in T-E-E-B-L-P-X-E-E. At this point, the inquirer might reasonably expect the letters to make intelligible words, but he will very likely be disappointed, for as in the case above, the letters thus extracted are themselves a cryptogram, doubly involved to discourage those who might have a casual acquaintance with the bilateral system. The next step is to apply the nine letters to what is commonly called a wheel or disk cipher, which consists of two alphabets, one revolving the other, in such a manner that numerous transpositions of letters are possible. In the accompanying cut, the A of the inner alphabet is opposite the H of the outer alphabet, so that for cipher purposes, these letters are interchangeable. The F and M, the P and Y, the W and D, in fact, all the letters may be transposed as shown by the true, as shown by the two circles. The nine letters extracted by the bilateral cipher may thus be exchanged for nine others by the wheel cipher. The nine letters are considered as being on the inner circle of the wheel and are exchanged for the nine letters on the outer circle, which are opposite the inner letters. By this process, the T becomes A, the two E's become L's, become two L's, the B becomes I, the L becomes S, and P becomes W, the X becomes E, and the two E's become two L's. The result is all is well which, broken up into words, reads all is well. Of course, by moving the inner disk of the wheel cipher, many different combinations, in addition to the one given above, can be made of the letters. But this is the only one which will produce sense, and the cryptogrammatist must keep on experimenting until he discovers a logical and intelligible message. He may then feel reasonably sure that he has deciphered the system. Lord Bacon involved the bilateral cipher in many different ways. There are probably a score of different systems used in the Shakespeare folio alone, some so, in, some so intricate that they may forever baffle all attempts at their decipherment. In those susceptible of solution, sometimes the A's and B's have to be exchanged. At other times, the concealed message is written backwards. Again, only every other letter is counted, and so on. There are several other forms of the literal cipher in which letters are substituted for each other by prearranged sequence. The simplest form is that in which two alphabets are written thus, so forwards and backwards. By substituting the letters of the lower alphabet for their equivalents in the upper one, a meaningless conglomeration results, the hidden message being decoded by reversing the process. There is also a form of the literal cipher in which the actual cryptogram is written in the body of the document, but unimportant words are, are inserted between important ones according to a prearranged order. The literal cipher also includes what are called acrostic signatures, that is, words written down the column by the use of the first letter of each line, and also more complicated acrostics in which the important letters are scattered through entire paragraphs or chapters. The two accompanying alchemical cryptograms illustrate another form of the literal cipher involving the first letter of each word. Every cryptogram based on the arrangement or combination of the letters of the alphabet is called a literal cipher. 2. The pictorial cipher. Any picture or drawing with other than its obvious meaning may be considered a pictorial cryptogram. Instances of pictorial cipher are frequently found in Egyptian symbolism and early religious art. The diagrams of alchemists and hermetic philosophers are invariably, are invariably pictorial ciphers. In addition to the simple pictorial cipher, there is a more technical form in which words or letters are concealed by the number of stones in a wall. In addition to the simple pictorial cipher, there is a more technical form in which words or letters are concealed by the number of stones in a wall, by the spread of bird's wings in a flight, by ripples on the surface of water, or by the length and order of lines used in shading. Such cryptograms are not obvious and must be decoded with the aid of an arbitrary measuring scale. 
the length of the lines determining the letter or word concealed, the shape and proportion of a building, the height of a tower, the number of bars in a window, even the proportions or attitude of the human body were used to conceal definite figures or characters which could be exchanged for letters or words by a person acquainted with the code. Initial letters of names were secreted in architectural arches and spans. A notable example of this practice is found on the title page of Montague's essay, Essays, 3rd edition, where an initial B is formed by two arches and an F by a broken arch. Pictorial cryptograms are sometimes accompanied by the key necessary for their decipherment. A figure may point toward the starting point of the cipher or carry in its hand some implement disclosing the system of measurement used. There are also frequent instances in which the cryptographer purposely distorted or improperly clothed some figure in his drawing by placing the hat on backwards, the sword on the wrong side, or the shield on the wrong arm, or by employing some similar artifice. The much-discussed fifth finger of the Pope's hand in Raphael's Sistine Madonna and the sixth toe of Joseph's foot in the same artist's Marriage of the Virgin are cunningly concealed cryptograms. 3. The Acroamatic Cipher The religious and philosophic writings of all nations abound with acroamatic uh, cryptograms, that is, parables and allegories. The acroamatic is unique in that the document containing it may be translated or reprinted without affecting the cryptogram. Parables and allegories have been used since remote antiquity to present moral truths in an attractive and understandable manner. The acroamatic cryptogram is a pictorial cipher drawn in words and its symbolism must be so interpreted. The Old and New Testaments of the Jews, the writings of Plato and Aristotle, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, Virgil's Aeneid, the Metamorphosis of Apuleius, and Aesop's Fables are outstanding examples of acromatic cryptography in which are concealed the deepest and most sublime truths of ancient mystical philosophy. The acromatic cipher is the most subtle of all, for the parable or allegory is susceptible of several interpretations. Bible students for centuries have been confronted by this difficulty. They are satisfied with the moral interpretation of the parable and forget that each parable and allegory is capable of seven interpretations, of which the seventh, the highest, is complete and all-inclusive, whereas the other six and lesser interpretations are fragmentary, revealing but part of the mystery. The creation myths of the world are acroamatic cryptograms, and the deities of the various pantheons are only cryptic characters which, if properly understood, become the constituents of a divine alphabet. The initiated few comprehend the true nature of this alphabet, but the uninitiated worship the letters of it as gods. James Campbell Brown reprints a curious cryptogra- or a cipher from Kircher. The capital letters of the seven words in the outer circle read clockwise form the word sulfur. From the words in the second circle, when read in a similar manner, is derived fixum. The capitals of the six words of the inner circle, when properly arranged, also read est sol. The following cipher is thus extracted, sulfur fixum est sol, which when translated is fixed sulfur is gold. Beginning with the word visita and reading clockwise, the seven initial letters of the seven words inscribed in the outer circle read vitriol. This is a very simple alchemical enigma but is a reminder that those studying works on Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, Alchemy, and Freemasonry should always be on the lookout for concealed meanings hidden either in parables and allegories or in cryptic arrangements of numbers, letters, and words. A cryptic depiction of divine and natural justice. The first circle portrays the divine antecedent or antecedents of justice, the second the universal scope of justice, and the third the result of human application of justice. Hence, the first circle deals with divine principles, the second circle with mundane affairs, the third circle with man. On the at the top of the picture sits Themis, the presiding spirit of law, and at her feet three other queens, Juno, Minerva, and Venus, their robes ornamented with geometric figures. The axis of law connects the throne of divine justice above with the throne of human judgment at the bottom of the picture. Upon the latter throne is seated a queen with the scepter in her hand, before whom stands the winged goddess Nemesis, the angel of judgment. 
The second circle is divided into three parts by two sets of two horizontal lines. The upper and light section is called the supreme region and is the abode of the gods, the good spirits, and the heroes. The lower and dark section is the abode of lust, sin, and ignorance. Between these two extremes is the larger section in which are blended the powers and impulses of both the superior and inferior regions. In the third or inner circle is man, a tenfold creature consisting of nine parts, three of spirit, three of intellect, and three of soul, enclosed within one constitution. According to Salinas, man's three spiritual qualities are thought, speech, and action. His three intellectual qualities are memory, intelligence, and will. His three qualities of soul are understanding, courage, and desire. The third circle is further divided into three parts called ages, the golden age of spiritual truth in the upper right section, the iron age of spiritual darkness in the lower right, and the bronze age, a composite of the two occupying the entire left half of the inner circle, and itself divided into three parts. The lowest division of the Bronze Age depicts ignorant man controlled by force, the central, the partly awakened man controlled by jurisprudence, and the upper, the spiritually illuminated man controlled by love. Both the second and third circles revolve upon the axis of law, but the divine source of law, heavenly justice, is concealed by clouds. All of the symbols and figures ornamenting the plate are devoted to a detailed amplification of the principles here outlined. 4. The Numerical Cipher Many cryptograms have been produced in which numbers and various sequences are substituted for letters, words, or even complete thoughts. The reading of numerical ciphers usually depends upon the possession of specially arranged tables of correspondences. The numerical cryptograms of the Old Testament are so complicated that only a few scholars versed in rabbinical lore have ever sought to ra unravel their mysteries. In his Oedipus Egypticus, or Egyptiacus, Athanasius, Athanas, Athanasius, in his Oedipus Egyptiacus, Athanasius Kircher describes several Arabian Kabbalistic theorems and a great part of the Pythagorean mystery was concealed in a secret method in vogue among Greek mystics of substituting letters for numbers. The most simple numerical cipher is that in which the letters of the alphabet are exchanged for numbers in ordinary sequence, the ordinal value. Thus, A becomes 1, B, 2, C, 3, and so on. Counting both I and J as 9, both U and V as 20. The word yes by this system would be written 23... Uh, 23518. This cipher can be made more difficult by reversing the alphabet so that Z becomes 1, Y2, X3, and so on, by inserting a non significant or uncounted number after each of the significant numbers, the cipher is still more effectively concealed. Thus, 23165918. The word yes is found by eliminating the second and fourth numbers, by adding 23518 together the sum 46 results. Therefore, 46 is the numerical equivalent of the word yes. According to the simple numerical cipher, the sum 138 is equal to the words, note carefully. Therefore, in a book using this method, line 138, page 138, or paragraph 138 may contain the concealed message. In addition to this simple numerical cipher, there are scores of others so complicated that no one without the key can hope to solve them. Authors sometimes base their cryptograms upon the numerical value of their own names. For example, Sir Francis Bacon repeatedly used the cryptic number 33, the numerical equivalent of his name. Numerical ciphers often involve the pagination of a book. Imperfect pagination, though generally attributed to carelessness, often conceals important secrets. The mispaginations found in the 1623 folio of Shakespeare and the consistent recurrence of similar errors in various volumes printed about the same period have occasioned considerable thought among scholars and cryptogrammatists. In Baconian cryptograms, all page numbers ending in 89 seem to have a special significance. The 89th page of the comedies in the 1623 folio of Shakespeare shows an error of type in the pagination the 9 being from a considerably smaller font than the 8. The 189th page is entirely missing, there being two pages numbered 187, and page 188 shows the second 8 scarcely more than half the size of the first one. Page 289 is correctly numbered and has no unusual features, but page 89 of the histories is missing. 
Several volumes published by Bacon show similar errors, page 89, <laughs> page 89 being often involved. There are also numerical ciphers from which the cryptic message may be extracted by counting every tenth word, every twentieth word, or every fiftieth word. In some cases, the count is irregular. The first important word may be found by counting 100, the second by counting 90, the third by counting 80, and so on until the count of 10 is reached. The count then returns to 100, and the process is repeated. 5. The Musical Cipher John Wilkins, afterwards Bishop of Chester, in 1641, circulated an anonymous essay entitled Mercury, or the Secret and Swift Messenger. In this little volume, which was largely derived from the more voluminous treatises of Trithemius and Salinas, the author sets forth a method whereby musicians can converse with each other by substituting musical notes for the letters of the alphabet. Two persons understanding the code can could converse with each other by merely playing certain notes upon a piano or other instrument. Musical cryptograms can be involved to an inconceivable point. By certain systems, it is possible to take an already existing musical theme and conceal in it a cryptogram without actually changing the composition in any way. The penance upon the notes may conceal the cipher, or the actual sounds of the notes may be, may be exchanged for syllables of similar sound. This latter method is effective, but its scope is somewhat limited. Several musical compositions by Sir Francis Bacon are still in existence. An examination of them might reveal musical cryptograms, for it is quite certain that Lord Bacon was well acquainted with the manner of their, con with the manner of their construction. 6. The Arbitrary Cipher The system of exchanging letters of the alphabet for hieroglyphic figures is too easily decoded to be popular. Albert Pike describes an arbitrary cipher based upon various parts of the Knights Templar's cross, each angle representing a letter. The many curious alphabets that have been devised are rendered worthless, however, by the table of recurrence. According to Edgar Allan Poe, a great cryptogrammatist, the most common letter of the English language is E. The other letters in their order of frequency are as follows. A, O, I, D, H, N, R, S, T, V, Y, C, F, Q, L, M, W, B, K, P, Q, X, Z. Other authorities declare the table of frequency to be E, T, A, O, N, I, R, S, H, D, L, C, W, uh, U, M, F, Y, G, P, B, V, K, X, Q, J, and Z. By merely continuing... <laughs> By merely counting the number of times each character appears in the message, the law of recurrence discloses the English letter for which the arbitrary character stands. Further help is also rendered by the fact that if the cryptogram can be split up into words, there are only three single letters which may uh, form words, A, O, A, I, and O. Thus, any single character set off from the rest of the text must be one of these three letters. For details of this system, see The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. To render more difficult the decoding of arbitrary ciphers, however, the characters are seldom broken up into words, and further, the table of recurrence is partly, is partly nullified by assigning two or more different characters to each letter, thereby making it impossible to estimate accurately the frequency of recurrence. Therefore, the greater the number of arbitrary characters used to represent any single letter of the alphabet, the more difficult it is to decipher any an arbitrary cryptogram. The secret alphabets of the ancients are comparatively easy to decode, the only requisites being a table of frequency, a knowledge of the language in which the cryptogram was originally written, a modern amount of patience, and a little ingenuity. 7. The Code Cipher The most modern form of cryptogram is the code system. Its most familiar form is the Morse code for use in telegraphic and wireless communication. This form of cipher may be complicated somewhat by embodying dots and dashes into a document in which periods and colons are dots, while commas and semicolons are dashes. There are also codes used by the business world which can be solved by the use of a private code book. Because they furnish an economical and efficient method of transmitting confidential information, the use of such codes is far more prevalent than the average person has any suspicion. In addition to the foregoing classifications, there are a number of miscellaneous systems of secret writing, some employing mechanical devices, others colors. 
A few make use of sundry miscellaneous objects to represent, word, to represent words and even complete thoughts. But as these more elaborate devices were seldom employed by the ancients or by the medieval philosophers and alchemists, they have no direct bearing upon religion and philosophy. The mystics of the Middle Ages, borrowing the terminology of the various arts and sciences, evolved a system of cryptography which concealed the secrets of the human soul under terms generally applied to chemistry, biology, astronomy, botany, and physiology. Ciphers of this nature can only be decoded by individuals versed in the deep philosophic principles upon which these medieval mystics based their theories of life. Much information relating to the invisible nature of man is concealed under what seem to be uh, chemical experiments or scientific speculations. Every student of symbolism and philosophy, therefore, should be reasonably well acquainted with the underlying principles of cryptography. In addition to serving him well in his researches, this art furnishes a fascinating method of developing the acuteness of the mental faculties. Discrimination and observation are indispensable to the seeker after knowledge, and no study is equal to cryptography as a means of stimulating these powers. Curious alphabets were invented by the early medieval philosophers to conceal their doctrines and tenets from the profane. Some of these alphabets are still used to a limited extent in their higher degrees of free, in the higher degrees of Freemasonry. Probably the most famous is the angelic writing termed in the above plate the writing called Malachim. Its figures are supposedly derived from the constellations. Advanced students of occult philosophy will come upon many valuable documents in which these figures are used. Under each letter of the first alphabet is its equivalent to English. Above each letter of the other three alphabets is its Hebrew letter equivalent. All right, so I'm going to finish reading this blog, and I'll go back into some of that other, you know, subject matter, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, so Manly Hall was saying that, like, if you apply or looked at the possible cryptograms in the ancient writings, you'd find probably a lot more than what's already known. And I would say the same goes for if you look at just certain natural things and sort of try to apply the science or just the idea that there's information embedded in the events or structure of things themselves, um, you might learn something. But there are great connections between the numbers one through nine themselves and our measurements of certain things, such as the melting point at 33 degrees, the boiling point at 212 degrees, the distance to the sun, uh, approximately 93 million miles, certain geographical places, scales, and ratios between these things, pi and phi, etc. They correspond to geometric things in pretty precise ways, and I think that we could understand more about the mathematics of physics and the psyche, when you understand that you can kind of telescope the larger things with the smaller and extrapolate things using the existing mathematics themselves. By observing the natural mechanisms and mathematics, we can perhaps better engineer things accordingly, rather than work as if we didn't have or need the blueprint sitting right beneath our noses. Adepts have known of the application of this knowledge in physical and esoteric engineering since as far back as the inception of the Freemasonic guilds, and is written about extensively in various books, one of which is even mentioned by Crowley in Magic by William Sterling called The Canon, from 1897, which talks about this ageless wisdom which was suppressed by the various establishments over the ages, or, you know, certain interests. What I recommend you do for practical magical work regarding the advent of the Maotian Ionic Tide, having done it myself for the past few years with great results, is to create a personal Geometria database by simply making a folder on your computer and uh, copying a Word file into about 3,000 different files numbered about 1 through 2,277, we'll say, the sum of the middle pillar. Create a list of all the different words you can find using the various primary Geometria ciphers, i.e. simple, Jewish, English, Hebrew, Greek, Hebrew applied to English, Hebrew applied to Sanskrit transliterated to English, or Tibetan, or other things even seem to be relevant. Uh, the new Eon English Kabbalah, even though I don't find it that... It's, I mean, it's 
it's okay, but it's just not very deep. But and begin reading Library El Veligis along with Liber Pene Prenumbra if you haven't. And when you can, start reading Kenneth Grant's Typhonian trilogies. These are merely creative ways of looking at and using natural energies in art for the purpose of creative manifestation, i.e. magic itself. The mundane development of a personal Kabbalah of Nine Chambers will help one to attune and develop their true will and magical universe, or the magnetic energy center and its unfoldment. The combined experience of this and basic preliminary mystico-magical ceremonial and meditative work helps one to also learn the mechanics of what Michael Berteau calls the Gnostic physics of the ontological realm, the level of mind which the Logos is centered. Manifestation from the heart level rather than the mind and body level is the goal of the aim of the true will or great work, the golden path or middle way. Again, because the surface level is the, the result of that inner um, encoded, that where the encoding pretty much happens. A crossed ring, which is the mark of the beast symbol, or also Malkuth, the number of the mark of the beast, this symbol being the mark of the beast, which is relinquished when one can themselves cross the abyss that is the ring past knot of the O gate of the Hay final. Again, pretty much the middle pillar, the hollow or hidden pillar, and it's uh, or what you could call the insurmountable, uh, the mountain of in initiation. It's, there's all these different things, but it's really finding Kether in Malkuth, uh, i.e. the egg, symbolic of the doorway of manifestation, the threshold of Malkuth itself. This knowledge becomes wisdom by what you make of it, and as Amalantra says, the egg is a work which must be done, the great work. By doing the work, we get to the key. So, again, key in Hebrew and full is 999. So, pretty much like slowly getting into this post, or leading up to it, I had like all these different books that I didn't even know uh, necessarily were going to lead into this subject. Like I had The Lost Language of Symbolism came up, and I had never heard of it, but I was looking in it, and it had all these interesting symbols and i looked in the index it actually mentioned crowley so that was surprising and then um like i had i had these two books the progradier correspondence and the magical record of progradier and i've looked into them and stuff but it never really stuck out until finally i was able to get progradier and the beast and i was reading it and it talks a lot more about like the Rosicrucian aspect or interest of uh, Frank Bennett. And then, so I go back to these and in the magical record of Progradier in the back, it's got this essay on Francis Bacon. And apparently even uh, Frank Bennett like created a sort of branch and Crowley had to like point out to him that true like Rosicrucians don't call themselves Rosicrucians. And yet his order was like the something Rosicrucian, um, well, I know it's in the Progradier co correspondence where the letter's actually at, and Crowley was like, well, anyway, I'll find it and I'll put the video up. Yeah, like, I just found that really interesting that this sort of, like, Francis Bacon Rosicrucian subject was kind of, like, becoming too, too much to just ignore. Like, it's not that I was ignoring it ever before either, it was just that I didn't know much about it, and slowly there was, like, a a bunch of things all came together at once. And like, I even, you know, with the whole Shakespeare thing, William Shakespeare, then I found the anatomy of melancholy, even uh, without any connection to any of this or knowing about it, really. I just saw it and I was like, holy shit, this might be interesting because it's so, it's an old book on melancholia or melancholy depression and like it's cures and stuff. And um, apparently there's even a book, William Shakespeare and Robert Burton by this Alexander Brown Brownlee. And he said that there's, it's highly likely that Robert Burton had a hand also in Shakespeare. Like they were probably friends. And, uh, so along with probably Francis Bacon and who knows like who else this Oxford guy. Um, 
But anyway, there's this book by Harold Bailey that I slowly found, or I ended up finding too when I was, I was like, well, I wonder what other books Harold Bailey has. And uh, he's got A New Light on the Renaissance, which talks about like Rosicrucians putting symbols in like the, uh, you know, the symbols or the uh, designs of books and whatnot. And then this book talks about that as well. But there's so many books apparently on this whole subject, like one even called Francis Bacon and his Secret Society. Uh, there's Shakespeare and Freemasonry. This one book I found said something about like Shakespeare, uh, creator of Freemasonry, being a remarkable examination of the plays and poems, which proves incontestably that these works were saturated in Masonry, that Shakespeare was a Freemason and the founder of the fraternity. And Alfred Dodd has a lot of books by or about uh, Francis Bacon. Um, but it's just, like I said, it's an interesting subject that I don't have any sort of like stock in any one opinion other than the opinion that it's fucking, it's really cool. And uh, I had no idea about any of it. And I think it's worth Noting, especially in connection with, again, the key of it all, the book of the law, um, and all the stuff that I've found pretty much since reading it. And, uh, fuck. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's just a stimulus to further research for myself and others. Um, but I did want to read this Francis Bacon essay which I don't know if that's like, I don't think it's copyrighted because probably in some, some like college basement somewhere. All right. So Francis Bacon, his connection with the Rosicrucians in Masonic societies. No one can study the history and life of Francis Bacon without soon being driven to the conclusion that a deep mystery surrounds him and his activities, and we should find Ben Jonson's estimation of his poetic genius, which, he said, filled up all numbers, unintelligible, if we only knew him by the few words that bear his name. There is no doubt that Bacon intentionally surrounded himself with mystery, that he might be more free to carry out his great aim, for, as he himself said, the glory of God is to conceal a thing, the glory of the king is to find it out. And Ben Jonson recognizes this fact in his verse on the great man. Thou standest as though a mystery thou didst, etc. His reason for preserving such secrecy in his procedure lay, doubtless, in the fact that at the time darkness, superstition, and ignorance prevailed throughout the length and breadth of the land. It is popularly supposed that the Elizabethan era was the golden age of learning, but that in those days great minds jostled each other both at court and tavern, but sidelights on the history of the period do not confirm this idea, nor is it possible to regard as truly enlightened a time when professional witch-finders were employed and paid at the rate of twenties. For every convicted witch, see Davenport Adams, Witches and Warlocks. We are told that during the thirty-nine years prior to the accession of James uh, I, Upwards of 17,000 people in Scotland alone were tried, tortured, and put to a horrible death for alleged witchcraft. This being but one example of the ignorance and superstition that prevailed, not only in England, but throughout Europe, and pretty much the world, still, <laughs> in various levels, in varying degrees. It was at this period of darkness that Francis Bacon set himself the stupendous task of enlightening the world. This great and godlike soul was born, we are told, at York House, A.D. 1651, in the Strand, London. Harold Bailey, in his Tragedy of Sir Francis Bacon, traces from a cipher story his royal connection. His father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, was counselor to Queen Elizabeth and a man of distinguished learning. His mother, Anne Cook, a lady of highly cultivated mind and great piety, and an eminent Latin and Greek scholar. These being the parents, says Dr. Rowley, you may, you may easily imagine what the issue is like. Anne Cook was the second wife of Sir Nicholas. 
His first wife was quite an extraordinary woman, of whom there is little to say, excepting that she left three sons and three daughters, none of whom appeared to have come much into contact with Francis. To Lady Bacon, two sons, Anthony and Francis, were born, both of whom must have been influenced from early infancy by the religious views of their mother, whom Francis especially esteemed as a saint of God. She sincerely believed that the cause of the Reformation was the cause of Christ, and was a Calvinist of the severest principles. She was closely related to the Greys, Burleys, Russells, and Hobbies, whose Calvinistic principles had sent many of them into exile, and some even to the block, and in her fierce repugnance to the Roman Church, she trained her sons. But Francis Bacon's religion was built upon a far wider and broader basis than that of his pious mother. At twelve years of age, Francis was entered at Trinity College, Cambridge, the master then being Whitgift, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury. And there he hoped to learn all that man could know. Before he had been there long, he became conscious of keen disappointment. He stayed only three years, during which time he was more than once driven away by outbreaks of the plague, on one occasion for as long as eight months. In the three years he had made much progress, but he begged his father to remove him, because by that time he had already conceived a profound contempt for the course of study pursued there. Leaving the university at fifteen, he carried with him the germs of his plan for reconstituting the whole round of arts and sciences, a plan from which he never departed. During his stay at the university, Dr. Raleigh tells us Francis first fell into the dislike of the philosophy of Aristotle, not for the worthlessness of the author, but for the unfruitfulness of the way. Being a philosophy only strong for disputations and contentions, but barren of the production of works for the benefit of the life of man. To him it was apparent that the strict followers of Aristotle could not hope to rise above the level of Aristotle, and indeed it seems that at the end of the 16th century, men neither knew nor desired to know more than what was to be learned from this school of philosophy. It was at this time, the date of which, says Raleigh, deserves to be recorded, to which the extraordinary youth of fifteen gave expression as follows. If our study of nature be thus barren, our method of study must be wrong. Might not a better method be found? And with him, even at that early age, to conceive what might be and ought to be, was to set himself to find means to put it into execution. It is not reasonable to suppose that this boy philosopher did not communicate such thoughts to his father and brother, to both of whom he was deeply attached, and whose ideas were known to have been in close sympathy with his own, and though we find but very little mention is made of either Sir Nicholas or Anthony, who was two years older than Francis, the latter invariably, the latter invariably speaks of his brother in words of devotion and affection, e.g., my dearest brother, Anthony, my comfort. What became of Anthony is almost unknown. He was evidently a generous, unselfish, and admiring brother, who thought no sacrifice too great to make for the benefit of Francis and his aims. And he seems to have acted as a kind of propagandist on the continent of Bacon's secret society, which was, as we shall try to show in our next article, the Rosicrucian Society. For the next year, a year fraught with much importance, as we shall see later on, for it was then that he first formulated great scheme for the enlightenment of the whole world. In the Fama Fraternitatis, the founder of the Rosicrucians is referred to as being of the age of 16. The young Francis studied at home. He was then sent to join the gay life of court and camp. As a member of the suite of Sir Amias Paulet, the English ambassador of the French court, he traveled through France and met many distinguished people. Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians How Francis Bacon spent the year at home after having left Cambridge is not recorded by his biographer, but we find some information on the matter in a Rosicrucian document, the Fama Fraternitatis. In this paper, full as are all those Rosicrucian manifestos of Bacon's ideas and peculiarities of expression, we read that the high and noble spirit of one of the fraternity was stirred up to enter into a scheme for a general reformation of the whole world and that he would follow the method of the ancients, for which purpose he traveled to the East. We may interpret this to mean that the young philosopher would study the ancient philosophies and hermetic writers. The Fama informs us that this young member was sixteen years old. 
and during one year had pursued his studies alone. This can only mean that having left college, he was pursuing his advanced studies alone and was endeavoring, as many others had done before, to get a knowledge of the first cause of things. Thus, at the end of his 16th year, we find Bacon with a definitely formed plan of his life's work to reform religion, science, and art. His first great effort in this scheme was for the widespread dissemination of knowledge was to get a number of the best intellects from amongst the students of the universities at home and abroad to collaborate with him in compiling a dictionary. This object especially links him with the whole system of the Rosicrucians, for he claims it as his own method by which the great deficiency of learning was to be remedied. And we find that Mrs. Henry Potts states that the author of Bama Fraternitatis makes a similar claim. To complete such a vast and difficult task, he sought the cooperation of the most eminent scholars of the day, for this was to him a sacred duty, one of the first and most needful steps towards the accomplishment of the great end he had in view. In reference to it, he says, I want this primary history to be compiled with a religious care, as if every particular were stated on oath, seeing that it is the book of God's works and so far the majesty of heavenly things may be compared with the humbleness of earthly things, a kind of second scripture. The friends he gathered round him to help him in his first great work formed themselves into a society which afterwards became known to the world as the Rosicrucian Society. We find the whole aim and object of this society set forth in Bacon in his New Atlantis, and it is this work that affords us important proof that Bacon was the founder of the Rosicrucian Society, for the society he hints at in the New Atlantis is no other than the Rosicrucians themselves. This is definitely affirmed by W. F. C. Wigston in his work on Bacon, Shakespeare, and the Rosicrucians. As the full test of this evidence should occupy too much space, I would refer those interested in the subject to the above-mentioned book, or, better still, to Mr. A. E. Waite's The Real History of the Rosicrucians, founded on their manifestos. On page 315 will be found the history of John Hayden, mystic, geomancer, and Rosicrucian, author of The Holy Guide, and on 348, John Hayden's voyage to the land of the Rosicrucians. And if this voyage is compared with Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, a startling discovery will be made. No effort is visible by Hayden to disguise his writing. Both the narratives run along smoothly, word for word, line for line, Perfect duplicates, the only difference being that Hayden calls the society the Temple of the Rosy Cross, and Bacon speaks of it as the House of Solomon, and sometimes as the College of the Six Days' Work. It may be said that Hayden was an impostor and copied from Bacon, but that this is not so is shown by Mr. W. F. C. Wigston, who vouches for him as a true gentleman and capable of such conduct. It seems that being a Rosicrucian and knowing this to be a teaching upon which the society was founded, he desired to preserve it to the order and took this means of doing so. There is further evidence that Bacon was the founder of this order. We know that he framed a scheme for universal reformation, and we find in the famous Rosicrucian document the Fama Fraternitatis, or a discovery of the most laudable order of the Rosy Cross, and again in the Confessio Fraternitatis, an attempt to call together the learned men of the world for this purpose. And also, this, the sworn book of Honorius, I think there was like 93, or no, I forgot how many magicians or wise men gathered, and uh, their knowledge like put into that book, or at least legendarily. Again, in the following passage from the Fama, we find, again, in the following passage from the Fama, we find the author throwing contempt upon Aristotle and Galen, as Francis Bacon had done at the university. Seeing the only wise and merciful God in these latter days hath poured out so richly his mercy and goodness to mankind, whereby we do attain more and more to the perfect knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ, and of nature, that justly we may boast of the happy time wherein is not only discovered unto us the half part of the world, which was heretofore unknown and hidden, but he hath also made manifest unto us many wonderful and never heretofore seen works in the creatures of nature, and moreover hath raised man, and moreover hath raised man, imbued them with great wisdom, 
which might partly renew and reduce all arts in this spotted and imperfect age to perfection, so that finally man might thereby understand his own nobleness and worth, and why he is called microcosmos, and how his knowledge extendeth in nature. Although the rude world herewith will be put will be but little pleased, but rather smile and scoff thereat. Also the pride and covetousness of the learned is so great it will not suffer them to agree together. But were they united, they might, out of all those things which in our age God doth so richly bestow upon us, collect librum naturae, or librum naturae, or a perfect method of all arts. But such is their opposition that they still keep, and are loth to leave, the old course, esteeming Porphyry, Aristotle, and Galen, yea, and that which hath but a mere show of learning, more than the clean and manifested light and truth. Now in this passage we find several leading ideas of Bacon strongly emphasized. If the learned men of the world could be brought together and work in harmony, they could bring about the perfection of all arts and make new discoveries in the secret of nature. This he clearly states in the New Atlantis to be one of the objects of the society of which he says, The end of our foundation is the knowledge of the causes and the secret motion of things, and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. Again, the disparagement of Aristotle and the Fama at once links it with Bacon, and recalls his constant dislike of him and all his school. In fact, the first striking record we have of Bacon is his disagreement at a very early age with the teaching of Aristotle. Another passage in the Fama runs, After this manner began the fraternity of the Rosy Cross, first by four persons only, and by them was made the magical language and writings with a large dictionary, which we yet use with great wisdom to God's praise and glory. This is exactly how Bacon commenced his great work. There is no historical evidence to show that such a society as the Rosicrucians existed at all prior to the 16th century. The only knowledge that we have of the society is obtained from the three documents, the Fama Fraternitatis, the Confessio Fraternitatis R.C., and the Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz. All these were published in 1614 to 1616. They were addressed to the learned in general and the governors of Europe. Although these documents appeared in Germany, there is reason to believe that they were published simultaneously in other countries. It is stated in the Fama that the Manifesto is set forth in five languages, and the same assertion is repeated in the Confessio. It seems that the German editions are the only ones that have survived. This probably has led to Germany being erroneously associated with the Rosicrucians, but various writers have testified that, in spite of their endeavors to trace the fraternity there, they were unable to do so, and therefore formed the opinion that its existence was merely an ingenious fiction. Although it did not take root in Germany, it flourished in England, where its founder lived. Now the story of the foundation of the secret brotherhood, or the Order of the Rosy Cross, the story of the death and burial of Christian Rosenkreutz, and the opening of his tomb is summarily disposed of by Mr. A. E. Waite in his Real History of the Rosicrucians. He says, Taking 1614 as the year when the Fama was published, and supposing the discovery of the burial place to have antedated the manifesto by the shortest possible period, we are brought back to the year 1494, one year after the birth of Paracelsus, whose book is supposed to contain the account. This point is, of course, conclusive. Thus, it is obvious that the history of Christian Rosenkreutz is not historically true, and that the society did not originate in the manner which is described in the Fama. There we have, at once, positive proof of the antedating of the origin of the society. This fact goes a long way to show that the real origin of the society was about the end of the 16th and early part of the 17th century, the time of Bacon's manhood. After finding Francis Bacon's initials amongst the members' names inscribed in the vault where the body of Christian Rosenkreutz lay under the altar, I maintain that the antedating of this tale of Christian Rosenkreutz was a splendid fiction, first for safety's sake, and also to give romance, interest, and color to the origins of the society. These manifestos in the chemical marriage have been stated to be the work of Johann Valentin Andreas, 
This Mr. Waite considers quite unacceptable, as Andreas himself seems to look upon them as a farce and never viewed them seriously. Much more evidence might be advanced to show that Bacon, the great and godlike spirit, was the founder of the secret society, from which so many other secret societies started in later times. The whole aim of his life and mind was the good of others. He was prepared for any sacrifice for any trouble for this end. This is writ large from his childhood. For we find this marvelous man, already when scarcely more than a boy, thinking out ways and means to lift mankind out of its ignorance and superstition. Such a scheme of universal reformation required an even more remarkable man to think it out, then to put it into execution. Only a man of place, power, of refinement, and of high culture, and learned in many tongues, could hope to infuse the idea of such a secret society for the bettering of humanity all over Europe. It could not be done openly. The envy, danger, and evil of the time can hardly be realized by us today. Mr. Waite truly remarks that, beneath the broad tide of human history, there flowed an undercurrent of secret society. But such a society only he, whom we know now in reverence as the Master R, who was at that time Francis Bacon, could have accomplished such a task. All the learning and wisdom of that century we owe to him, and in reading and studying the life and work of Francis Bacon, we are studying the life and work of a living master, one who has never left his work, but is now, today, as closely in touch with the society as he was when he founded it. He it was who brought to us the hermetic and ancient mysteries in the form of Rosicrucian and Masonic societies, who at that time admitted woman on the same terms of man, for he knew no injustice or inequality, but only love. The mystic has tried to solve this. He has solved it on the basis that he exists in a universe of eternal now in which everything that ever has been, is, or will be, is in a state of suspended immediacy, and that by the proper extension or expansion of his own consciousness, he can attune himself to immediacy and to the experience that it contains. I think this is probably the mysterious school of the Holy Spirit, which was part of the Rosicrucian literature. And in this school, it is said that every living thing is an ABC daria, or taking his ABC lessons. We are all ABC students in the College of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>